8.55. Almost midnight. Enough time for one more story. One more story before 12. Just to keep us warm. John Carpenter is the last of a generation of masters of horror. We've lost Wes Craven, George Romero, and Toby Hooper. And while we have a host of new age talent, the old guard has mostly retired or passed away. While the video game playing, music composing curmudgeon hasn't made a feature film since 2010's The Ward, he has created an indelible mark on the history of horror. He had impactful, or at least fun, titles in four different decades. While he had hits in the 70s and 90s, his decade of excellence was undoubtedly the 80s. Something we here at Joe Blow Horror Originals are admittedly pretty passionate about. It's hard to pick his best of the decade, but there is no debating that he started them off with a hit. Released on February 1st, 1980, The Fog was a hit for both Carpenter and Avco Embassy, making $21 million on its $1 million budget. The movie is sandwiched, theatrically anyway, between the slasher king and the first screen appearance of one of the greatest characters of all time, Snake Plissken in Escape from New York. On top of that, he just kept releasing cult classic after cult classic with efforts like The Thing, Big Trouble in Little China, and They Live, along with some more commercially viable products. On today's episode of 80s Horror Memories, we're taking a dive into what is often a forgotten gem from one of the great masters of horror. Today we're keeping the radio on and taking a look at the ghost revenge story, The Fog. Well. Stay up with me, and I'll figure out some way to keep you occupied. The Fog is a great introduction to the filmography of John Carpenter. My older brother, who was something of a gateway drug dealer for me in terms of horror, would know exactly what and when to show me a particular movie. I wasn't ready for The Evil Dead, but I could dip my toe into the series via Army of Darkness. A Nightmare on Elm Street was a bit too scary and serious, but perhaps Dream Warriors had enough schlock and humor to not give me nightmares. It didn't work, but that was a valiant effort. While The Thing and even Halloween were too scary for me, The Fog was a great fit. Video Unlimited down the street always had on display that super cool VHS cover with Jamie Lee Curtis trying to keep something at bay with the tagline of The Fog. What you can't see won't hurt you. It will kill you. Between midnight and one, it will find you. The Fog is, is the first John Carpenter movie I saw. This was the quintessential video store experience. While Blockbuster and Hollywood Video were the places to go with your family to pick out a couple of films to watch together, the mom and pop experience was how you built your taste. It wasn't just a routine or something to look forward to at the end of the week. It was a damn ritual. We would stop at the corner store to pick up candy and then walk into Video Unlimited and head straight past the new releases. New movies were and are an important part of the journey, but walking the aisles of horrors past and making a mental list of what you wanted to see someday was great. Most of the VHS boxes were the same size, but every now and then you'd have a huge one like Zombie that lets you know, we are going to eat you. This was forbidden fruit that I knew I'd have to wait years to get to, but I'd pick up the box every damn week and imagine what the movie would be like. Getting to watch things like The Fog or Motel Hell after looking at the box art and the pictures on the back was just how you grew up. It was always way better than you ever imagined. The 
The movie, at its heart, is a ghost revenge story that follows the town of Antonio Bay on its 100th anniversary, where the crew of the Elizabeth Dane have come back to collect a debt. This debt is of both money and the souls of the descendants of those that conspired to crash the ship so that Captain Blake couldn't get a leper colony started near the town. It's a mostly quiet little thriller with a ton of jump scares that was originally seen as far too short at only 90 minutes. One of the film's best scenes is the opening fireside story session with John Houseman and a bunch of the town's kids. This is one of the few scenes that they had to add in later to get the movie to its final runtime of 90 minutes. While the original idea of the film was to keep it as a classic PG fright fest, these new added scenes of terror and gore shot the final product to an R rating, even if it is a rather soft R. The scene at the beginning when he, you know, picks Jamie Lee Curtis up and within five minutes they're in bed together. The movie was his first theatrical film in over two years after the made for TV projects Elvis starring future collaborator Kurt Russell and the chiller Someone's Watching Me, starring his then wife, Adrian Barbeau. The talent in front of and behind the camera for The Fog is a murderer's row, pun intended, of Carpenter regulars. In addition to co-writing and producing with Deborah Hill, the flick was shot by Dean Cundy, had makeup effects by Rob Botton, and Tommy Lee Wallace did both the editing and was in charge of production design. The acting was led by Barbeau in her film debut after years on TV, Tom Atkins and Jamie Lee Curtis. The supporting cast was Nancy Loomis, George Buck Flower, and Charles Cyphers in various minor roles too. Hell, he even gave characters the names of his friends like Tommy and Nick and both Rob Botton and Tommy Lee Wallace appear as undead creatures in the titular fog. Carpenter himself even plays Bennett in the first church scene of the movie and throws out the name of his band, the Coop de Villes, as one of the bands played on the radio before everything goes downhill. It isn't just John and his buddies hanging out making a movie though. A couple of key players were played by bigger than usual names in Hal Holbrook and Janet Lee. Holbrook plays Father Malone, who is a descendant of one of the conspirators. He finds the journal as well as the stolen gold that was claimed after the Danes sank. While Holbrook is usually outstanding, particularly in Creepshow just a couple years later, he sleepwalks a little bit through his screen time here. Originally, that role was offered to horror legend Christopher Lee, but he had to turn it down after he became unavailable. This wasn't the first time that Lee was sought out for a Carpenter movie either, as he was an original choice for Dr. Sam Loomis in Halloween. I love Donald Pleasance, but I would have loved to see how that turned out. Janet Lee was an Oscar-nominated actress that had a great career before this movie and was able to appear with her daughter, Jamie Lee Curtis. The movie's story moves like an anthology, with the fog almost being a wraparound tale to the intersecting characters that we are watching. Adrian Barbeau doesn't even appear on screen with any of the other main characters, and instead serves as a guide. She does get her son saved by Tom Atkins and Jamie Lee Curtis and guides them throughout the town with warnings of where the fog is and where it's headed. This anthology-like idea must have stuck with Carpenter because for years he wanted to produce a series based on the subject. Instead of having anyone from the movie, however, the fog itself would serve as the central character and conceit, with other supernatural tales occurring, and only slight threads tying the stories together. Sadly, this never happened, and we were treated, no, subjected, to the 2005 remake that easily deposits itself near the bottom of the early 2000s remake craze in terms of quality. The Fog gets unfairly forgotten in Carpenter's impressive catalog and is often seen as almost too much of a slow burn. But honestly, there's very little fat to trim 
and all of the elements work wonderfully in Unition. While it wasn't one of his most well-known scores compared to Halloween or Escape from New York, it complements the visuals masterfully as a chilling piano chord that repeats at different speeds during the different scenes and goes full-on ambient noise when it needs to. It tells you something is out there in the fog and that you don't want anything to do with it. The ghost zombies inside the fog even carry with them their own oppressive tune that keeps the energy exactly where it needs to be, while building a tension that is almost subliminal to the viewer while it's happening. It's honestly one of his more remarkable and unsettling scores. And that's saying something. Dean Cundy shot the movie so well with the music and actually modeled the look of the film after Val Lewton's 1940s atmospheric horrors, I Walked with a Zombie and Isle of the Dead. He described Lewton's movies as very shadowy, all suggestion, and he has all sorts of melodrama going on. I was a real fan of that sort of thing. Probably the best decision was to have Cundy shoot the movie in anamorphic widescreen. It adds to the moodiness and gives it the look of a much higher budgeted film. Speaking of which, while the movie says it was a $1 million budget, Evco Embassy spent more than three times that amount with the advertisements in print, radio, and TV. In addition to the traditional ways that movies were advertised, they even put fog machines in select theaters where the movie was being shown. Can you imagine seeing the fog with some real fog? The only thing missing would be to have someone knock slowly and methodically on the theater doors during the showing. Speaking of which, the movie follows a less is more strategy in terms of its pacing. While Cundy shot the movie in that gorgeous aspect ratio, the movie doesn't fill up the screen with gore or even the revenge seekers housed in the cover of fog. There are tons of jump scares thrown in this movie, and I'm talking the classics. These are cat jump levels of cheese. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with that. But the best moments from the movie happen in a more subtle way. The downed shipmates show up in a thick fog and knock on the door in a slow, methodical way. When you open the door, there isn't anything to see. But the second your guard goes down, they make their move. It's such a marker for the end of the 70s, that film. It's like a goodbye to that sort of mindset. One of the best examples of this happens early on when three men are out to sea the night before the real action begins. The fog approaches their vessel, and they are approached by a ship within said fog. It docks near them, and before the two men on the deck can react, they are surrounded and killed by the former lepers. The last man standing inside the ship is snuck up on as the glow from the lights within the fog shows the assailant getting closer and closer. It's great stuff that they don't do as much of anymore in modern horror. The rest of the kills are somehow brutal yet bloodless. Charles Cipher's weatherman and love interest to Barbo's DJ gets killed while we watch and Stevie listens on in horror. You see some of the weapons but don't really get a clear look until the end of the movie with a final jump scare that happens to be the film's best one yet. That knocking, by the way, is something that my brothers and I would do to each other at night and is going to be a staple after I show my kids what waits in the fog. The movie was shot in April and May of 1979 for around 30 days, mostly at Raleigh Studios in Hollywood, California. They did choose a few on-location shoots to really push the coastal town vibe with scenes filmed in Point Reyes, Bolinas, Inverness, and some of the church shots being filmed at the Episcopal Church of the Ascension in Sierra Madre. All these locations look amazing and had fog as a regular occurrence, which is why the characters aren't worried about it at all in the beginning of the film. While everyone remembers Blake and his ghosts within the fog, a lot of the cooler scares get lost in the shuffle. 
DJ Stevie's son finds a gold coin that morphs into a broken plank of wood after the waves crash over it. When she takes it with her to work, it begins to leak seawater all over some equipment and starts a speech from Blake that is probably the most eerie scene in the film. The voice is distorted, yet still pained and angry. While this is the only time you can hear his voice, a wise decision in retrospect, it stays with you the rest of the movie. The ending is great without being sequel bait too. Blake came to get his gold and take his revenge. So why would he think that the cross would take care of everything? Father Malone finds out the hard way that Blake was a man of his word. There isn't a lot of mystery behind the fog. It's just damn good movie making. Scream Factory thought enough of it, and damn near every other Carpenter classic, to give it one of their outstanding transfers, loaded with all the special features that fans love to dig into. While he tried to go back a few times to explore the idea of ghosts, most prominently in Ghosts of Mars and his final feature to date, The Ward, neither of those came close to firing on all cylinders, like his 80s opening masterpiece. While the rest of his 80s output rightfully deserves the love it gets, The Fog is certainly no slouch. Let us know in the comments what you think of this under-discussed classic. After you get through Halloween and The Thing, make sure you watch the clock. If it's five minutes until midnight, pop in The Fog. You have time enough for one more story. Just one more to keep you warm. We hope you enjoyed our dive into some of the most iconic horror movies and pop culture references from the year 1980. Next up, we take a shortcut through the cabin in the woods, get bitten by a werewolf in the wilds of England, and see the rise of slashers in the year 1981. Until next time, gore hounds. Hi friends, your humble narrator Tyler Nichols here, and I hope that you enjoyed that episode of 80s Horror Memories. If you missed our previous episode, click over here. If you want to see more from our series, click up here. And if you're not subscribed yet, what are you doing? Subscribe right here. And most importantly, stay spooky, folks.